I'm Dave Taylor, and I'll be talking about signed eBPF programs from a cross-platform point of view. In other words, covering both Linux and Windows and potentially any others. So let's go ahead and get started. All right. So on the top, you see a classic um, arrangement of components for eBPF, where an eBPF program goes through a couple of different forms, say from a uh, source code, if you're using a compiler, to eBPF bytecode, and then finally into, say, native code uh, after it's been JIT compiled. And the verifier's job in the middle there, where it goes from the red line to the green line, is to uh, decide whether that program is authorized to run. That's done by saying, is it provably safe? And is at that same point in time, is the source that program actually authorized? And so what do we mean by is the source authorized? Well, this is where the concept of code signing comes in, in the future, where in the past it might be, oh, is it submitted by root or something fairly simple like that? Okay. Now, just um, one thing that I consider mostly out of scope for this talk, but uh, there's also been some discussion about is, could you actually do verification as part of that signing process such that when it gets submitted, it's, that the signature check could also verify that it was verified under the appropriate things? There is some discussions about that too, but I'm not really going to be talking about that. We can take that offline if you're interested in that topic. So with that, we're only going to talk about how you decide whether the program source is actually authorized. So when we look back at different code signing mechanisms unrelated to BBF or not specific to BPF, right? There's a couple of different varieties that exist already out there, okay? Especially on different operating systems, there's not a one size fits all solution. So for example, uh, since a lot of the BPF community is familiar with Linux, let me talk about Windows first, or at least the Microsoft hypervisor first, which is not Windows specific. And then generally, anytime that you have a type one hypervisor, where a hypervisor that's type one means it's done underneath the kernel, right? Just because you have kernel code or you can get root on, or you can get kernel code doesn't mean that you can run arbitrary code. When you have a type one hypervisor that says for any code page to be executable, it has to be signed by a signature that the hypervisor trusts, a key that the kernel even doesn't have access to. Many times a code signing key will not even be online. It might be off in a back room someplace in an HSM, uh, only accessible through some builder signing pipeline. Okay. So what this means is that you can't actually inject, say, dynamic code pages, right, if you're doing this, right, because you'd have to get that signature, and that signature might not be doable at runtime. This does interfere with some scenarios that people actually want to do, say, BPF trace, for example. BPF trace, you say, well, I want the, the admin on the machine to be able to type in some filter, and that gets JIT compiled and then can run um, at runtime because BPF trace is trusted. Okay. And so that type of scenario and the type one hypervisor enforced code integrity um, seems that they're mutually incompatible. Okay. Now we'll talk more about, well, what do you do in that case? Okay. But uh, you'd say that's actually intentionally incompatible. Whereas other techniques like binary signing and volume signing that do um, enforcement at the OS level rather than at the hypervisor level means there's a lot more flexibility and things like dynamic code can be supported. So you certainly see some examples of things that fit those three categories, uh, but there may be others across as you look across different OSs and platforms out there. So what do we do here? Well, if the, the point of this presentation is largely a survey and then what to do amongst the heterogeneity. So a survey of different types of techniques. Okay, eBPF programs, as shown in that first picture, can be in various forms over the lifetime, right? So they may start out as source code. Well, it's probably not terribly interesting to sign the source code itself. Signing the bytecode is very interesting. Um, interpreters are now seen as being insecure, and so we kind of cross that one off. But the verifier is what operates on bytecode and saying, uh, if we can have bytecode be signed, there's a bunch of things you can do there. There's also cases for saying signed position independent code, meaning maybe after JIT compilation before prelocation. So for example, on Windows, classic drivers are written in that format and the same on other operating systems. So bytecode and position independent code are both interesting cases for signing under different scenarios. In theory, you could also say, I wanna sign the native code after relocation, but that's not really very interesting because relocation replaces things with machine specific addresses. So a signature would only be useful for that particular machine or any particular point in time. 
A different style of approach, though, is to not sign the eBPF program per se, but rather to sign the thing that generates the program if the program is either hard coded into a user mode application or perhaps generated from a user mode application. Say, well, I'm just going to sign the application and then any programs that, that one runs might be authorized. Okay, so this, again, this is a survey of different approaches that are out there. To take this question one step farther, well, does the signature over code, does that cover anything other than the EPPF program or is it just the EPPF program? So again, when we look around different approaches being implemented or discussed, uh, one approach is to say, well, I have a signature that only covers the EPPF program, regardless of whether that's in bytecode or position independent code, see previous slide. Uh, another approach is to say, well, it actually covers more than just the EBPF program, okay? So approaches that say, uh, you know, leave, bumblebee, use, it may cover things that are more than just the bytecode or position independent code. So for example, uh, leaf uses packages where that package could be a, a user uh, land application plus any EBPF programs that it uses, okay? And, you can push that out onto an like existing machine and contrast a solution like Bumblebee packages things as containers, right? And then pushes out the containers with something like Kubernetes. Uh, this approach lets you distribute them through a regular app store, but it means you may be covering things as well. And you're not actually checking things at the time the eBPF program gets uh, loaded per se, or at least you're not checking the signature just over the eBPF program. So if you consider an approach that passes the signature along with the EBPF program, it doesn't quite match if in that type of solution. Then there's uh, possible approaches that sign, say, a repository that contain multiple EBPF programs, whether that repository is, say, a file system, a directory, or some remote uh, repository, some other type, where here the authorization would just check, does the program come from such a repository? And then finally, just like the last slide, uh, at the bottom, you have a way of just signing, well, I'm not going to sign the program at all. I'm just going to sign, say, the application that generated it or the application that loads it and say, as long as that application is consigned, it can do anything. This is the type of approach that's usually advocated when talking about tools like BPF Trace that do dynamic code generation. Um, however, the notion of signing the source of the program requires either an interpreter, which, as we've said, is, is, is no longer seen as being secure, so we don't want that, okay? or the ability to have dynamic code pages, meaning uh, it does not work with things like hypervisor uh, enforced code integrity. So what you'll find is that there's no like one size fits all possible scenarios today, okay? And so given that, well, how many different solutions do we need, right? When we have uh, heterogeneous scenarios and requirements? Well, I'm going to argue the answer is still uh, one asterisk, meaning I'm gonna push the problem around. We'll come back to that. This is where this concept of a gatekeeper comes in, credit uh, originally proposed by John Fastabend. Uh, here, the point is that what's essential is the flexibility, not just hard coding whatever the answers are to the previous slides, right? Leaving that up to, say, the admin of the scenario to say what the answer needs to be in that scenario. So we talked about the example of, do you have HVCI or do you have BPF trace? If you can't have both, which one wins, okay? Uh, another example, right? is if you need uh, across different customers or different scenarios or different you know, organizations or admins, you say, I want to have a policy that varies by, well, is it position independent code or is it uh, byte code? Um, and what does the signature cover? Is it just the byte code? Does it cover that in an application? There's heterogeneity there. Third example would be, um, what does the uh, distro or OS used by default maybe unrelated to IBPF? So, for example, the typical Windows policy is that only Microsoft signed code can be loaded in the kernel. And that's because if you call out Microsoft support, they're going to support it if it's actually signed by Microsoft, right? Whereas uh, often people will use Linux specifically because they don't want the distro to control what programs can run, that the admin is in control. And so if you want eBPF to apply to both these categories of policies of code execution, then what do you do? Third or fourth example is if you want custom policies based on things like which key does it have to be signed by? And uh, is it actually possible to run an interpreter or not? Please know um, whether it varies by user ID, location or something else. So that's what this gatekeeper comes in that says, Rather than hard coding the answer or the constraints into the eBPF framework, instead, we're going to put those into an eBPF program that can override whatever the default is. 
Okay, the program can then run on the device such that the policy can then meet the availability and latency requirements for being able to load eBPF programs. So let's dive into this in one deeper level. Again, trying to keep our analysis um, across multiple platforms here. So if you don't have an eBPF gatekeeper program, okay, then it means you've got to have some hard-coded default. In other words, who authorizes the gatekeeper program, right? So the, the distro or the OS, the eBPF platform, um, regardless of whether it's in a in a uh, an offload card or an operating system or what have you, then it's got to have some hard coded default. So let's say somebody picked a very strict default that says I'm only going to permit eBPF programs signed by the distro vendor. Okay, which as I mentioned, you know Microsoft had that as the classic policy for Windows drivers, right? Well, you can still use the gatekeeper, right? The gatekeeper can then be loaded anytime after startup to loosen the policy. It just means the gatekeeper has to be signed by the distro vendor. Okay. Um, now, of course, some people have tor will will not like that, and the um, will not like the strict default. And the point of this presentation is to not take a position on which policies are good or bad, but rather to say that the gatekeeper can still be used in both cases. Okay. The other case is say the loose default, which is to say to permit any program permitted by an admin or submitted by an admin. Here, as long as the gatekeeper is loaded before anything that's intended to deny it's still fine, right? If it's loaded after that, then of course you can't prevent something that was already done, right? So in Linux, this just means it's loaded as part of the boot process. The gatekeeper has to be loaded as part of the boot process. Whereas on Windows where eBPF is a separate driver, it means that you have to be loaded as part of starting the eBPF driver, right? In all these different cases here, you can still use the gatekeeper, right? The analysis is the notion of the flexibility and programmability itself is what is good. So just to sum up before I open up for questions here, uh, the notion of signing programs increases security over just proving safety. The gatekeeper can apply across multiple OSs and distros, right? Multiple Linux distros, Windows and Linux, multiple Windows SKUs, not just those, anything else, okay? They can accommodate multiple types of signing and distribution mechanisms, which allows the problem of the tussles and the heterogeneity to be put on the burden of those who author the gatekeepers rather than on the core eBPF runtimes. And so with that, I will open it up for questions at this point. Thank you.